revolutionary life of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And before we let you folks jump in, um, we do hope to answer some questions if we have time from the audience at the end of the conversation. So um, if you do have a question for either of our guests, please um, go to the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A icon. I think everyone is familiar with the technology these days. Um, so please add those questions there. And my colleague Lars Nelson will gather those up and be back toward the end of the conversation to ask those questions. So, okay, gentlemen, please take it away. All right, um, it's an honor, Sam, to, you know, I've, I've known Sam and I've, I've admired him and, uh, you know, know his work and his work has taught me so much. This film is brilliant and it's an honor to be um, your interlocutor for the, for the evening. Um, you know, my first question, Sam, is, uh, you know, we were talking in the green room about um, these films, you know, alongside your MLK and the FBI, Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, the United States versus Billie Holiday. You know, there's even a scene of FBI surveillance in Regina King's uh, great new film, One Night in Miami, as well. Um, you know, so what, what are you to make of this? Because you've cut your teeth in, in these sort of very historic uh, films like Eyes on the Prize and being part of that. But right now, a, a complete standalone film on MLK and the FBI. Uh, David, based on David Garrow, I know that was the inspiration. Uh, uh, and that book came out maybe around 1981. And, and what do you think, what do you make of all of this happening at the same time? We're sort of looking, re-examining these revered iconic figures of, of the 1960s, the civil rights black power era. I, I think what's, what's, what's fascinating is that, you know, always when you have, and you're a historian, you know how time makes things much more sort of relevant. So here we are, 50, 60 years, almost seven years, you know, from when, you know, the FBI was monitoring and surveilling Billie Holiday, you know, and then you have my film, MLK FBI, and you have Judas and the Black Messiah, when the FBI basically decided they needed to get rid of Fred Hampton. So it's really interesting that, you know, history really has a certain kind of resonance and gravitas the longer you step away from it. So it seems, it almost, it feels almost natural that this would be the time to really dig into and, and sort of demystify the mythology of the FBI, which for many, many years has been one of the, this is the, our, our American police, our national law enforcement arm that fights the, fights the bad guys. They were considered the good guys. You know, I was saying to someone, I grew up in the 60s as a teenager, 1964, every Sunday night, man, I would watch religiously this series called the FBI with Efren Zimbalist Jr. Yeah. And, you know, because I thought the FBI was the cat's pajamas. I, mean, I thought they were the good guys. They were, <laughs> out. They, were, they, were they were, you know, taking out John Dillinger, man. They were going to deal with the communists, the Red Scare. So yeah. I didn't know the, 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 the level of duplicity and hypocrisy that the FBI had, had stooped to, you know, when in the 60s with Dr. King. And even before now with Billy Holiday, so it's it's obviously it's about time the FBI gets to gets to see we get to see who they really are. You know, let's get into that, um, Sam, because your film does an excellent job of um, even before we get to the bureau's relationship with Dr. King and the civil rights movement of looking at you know who J. Edgar Hoover was you know, the head of the FBI, 48 years, 1924 to 1972, 73, um, uh, you know, recruiting a certain type of conservative white male, uh, you know, fraternity football player, you know, six foot uh, tall and really burnishing the image of the FBI. So I think, um, I think it's important for us to talk about that, because certainly the FBI uh, was this white supremacist organization, part of the Department of Justice, but the way in which they were able to um, impact American culture, including African American culture, is very important because, like you said, you grew up in the 60s and, you know, today's FBI, and you grew up admiring these folks. So tell us about sort of like the impact of the FBI uh, on American political and popular culture? Because certainly Hoover seems to have had 
a vice grip on presidents from the time he was in office, you know, the whole 48 years and the power just grows and increases in the context of the Cold War. Um, but also in popular culture, like you said, they become heroes. Uh, and as we'll see with, with Dr. King and the movement, they are really anything but that. But the, the, the narrative that they, they self, the mythology, the self-creation, I thought your film was uh, just very powerful in a, in of its own on just demystifying that well, mythology. Well, the thing, the thing to remember, you know, the thing that's fascinating is that the FBI started this really sort of uh, cultural sort of presentation of themselves as far back as the 30s. If you go back to 1935, mm -hmm. Warner Brothers created a film called G-Men with James Cagney, you know, where he plays an FBI agent, you know, and that was sort of the beginning of building with, you know, the FBI's permission, you know, this ideal that the FBI were these good guys who were going to ferret out the bad guys. And it continued in Hollywood with the support of, of the Hoover administration, Hoover, Hoover, Hoover's FBI for many years. I mean, if you look at the clips we use in the film from Walk a Crooked Mile, I was a communist for the FBI, Big Jim McClain with John Wayne and James Arness, the FBI story. They were constantly, you know, making sure that the mythology of the FBI would be cemented in the American psyche, you know. Mm -hmm. And the, and you see also the promotional films that the FBI did about themselves. You see Hoover out there with the Tommy gun. You yes. see the young kids asking Hoover, you know, Mr. Hoover, can we be G-men? You know, you see the FBI agents, as you say, all white men, all a certain height, all a certain athletic bill. You know, that was promoting this notion of who the FBI was all about. You know, I mean, I, you know, it's amazing how how strong that myth stood for so long. I mean, yeah. in, in reality, when you think about it, though, Peniel, the FBI shows are still on TV. You know, yes. They're still on TV. They're still promoting it. The only difference is, is that hopefully many of us who watch these shows or don't watch these shows understand that that's not really the FBI, you know. So they were an organization whose job was as we all know, was to ferret out what they call people who were left of center, who they thought were going to upset the notion of American democracy. And the notion of American democracy was basically, it was white people as first class citizens and black people were second class citizens. And nobody, nobody seemed to have a problem with it unless black people were starting to make, make some, you know, make demands mm -hmm. in the 30s and the 40s with the Legal Defense Fund and Thurgood Marshall and all those others, you know. So the so by the time Dr. King and Ralph Aranathy and Fred Shuttlesworth comes on the scene and you know and others, it had to really frighten. It had to. It didn't have to. It really frightened people like yeah. Hoover, who basically was saying, "Oh my God!" That's why he uses this term. That's why he used this term: the rise of a black messiah. Yeah, because they were all of a sudden he was a black man who was galvanizing people to say we no longer want to be second class citizens we no longer want to sit on the back of the bus we no longer want to have to be able not to sit in the restaurant we no longer want to be able to drink at any water fountain we didn't, shouldn't say colored or white or go to any bathroom that that we want to go to so this was this was frightening to many americans and the thing that we should remember that the fbi was not an outlier yeah. they were basically doing the service that most Americans wanted in the 50s and the 60s. That's why Dr. King, you know, in the film, we have this poll between who's more popular, Hoover or Dr. King, and Hoover in 64 was more popular than Dr. King. Oh, yeah, no, it's something like 50 to 15 percent. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I saw in the film that reminded me of now, too, is when um, somebody's being interviewed, a white woman who's saying King is such a troublemaker and a communist, and has the big picture from the Highlander Folk School as a That's kind right. of training school, right? Uh, and I think about QAnon and the conspiracy theories of now, and they said, this is our proof, right? Um, you know, I love to have a discussion of, you know, MLK. And I think one of the things you see with Dr. King in your film is that um, there are so many people around him, whether it's Bayard Rustin, whether it's Jack O'Dell, Stanley Levison, who the FBI starts to investigate. And right. you really show us how they started to, through Clarence Jones and the conversation with Clarence Jones, really go move away from um, just the political and try to get deep into the personal as well and use his personal uh, uh, romantic affairs to 
destabilize the movement. But but talk to us about how um, initially King thinks that the FBI has better things on their hands and aren't going to be so obsessed with him. And you know the FBI, they they were obsessed with Malcolm too, but certainly with King. Hoover had something that was very, very personal and mean and, and vicious against Dr. King, this idea of moral turpitude, even though there's all, all kinds of speculation on Hoover's personal life and his private life. Well, this, this, he, this, is, this is what's fascinating, you know, Camille, is that he looked at Dr. King as someone who was absolute fraud. He was a man who was a man of the cloth, right? You know, he's a minister, you know, he's preaching this nonviolence, you know, He's far, far as Hoover can see him, he's holier than thou. But, but underneath, behind the, behind the curtain of yeah. the Wizard of Oz, he's not who he says he is in terms of what, how Hoover you know, sees it and his agents see it. So that had to really outrage Hoover. I mean, that's what led to Hoover and Sullivan creating that letter, you know, yeah. basically in the voice of an African American, that we know who you are, you know, we know what you're all about, you know, you know what you need to do. Intimate they should kill himself. I mean, the reason that Hoover makes the statement that King is the most notorious liar in the world is because the things he has uncovered with his, to his agents when they're, when they're bugging and wiretapping Dr. King's rooms in the different cities, you know, the fact that he had these extramarital affairs, which, you know, Hoover, you know, it's, 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 such, a, it's such a level of hypocrisy is mind boggling, mm -hmm. particularly when you think he was a man, Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, who never married, who had a relationship supposedly with Clyde Tolson that lasted as long as he was in the FBI. He, he, he was the director of the FBI. So, you know, it's that old saying my mother would say when I was a kid, it's the pot calling the kettle black, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, it, that was tremendous hypocrisy. But in, in Hoover's mind, from my perspective, he didn't see this hypocrisy. He see it as a black man stepping out of his lane, yeah. you know, and causing, you know, difficulty. Because why can't you be happy with the way American status quo is the, at that point in time? And what's so interesting about your film, Sam, is as we see, as we progress throughout the film, I mean, you go back and forth, you go to Montgomery, you're in Birmingham, March on Washington, but then <laughs> yeah. uh, a poor people's campaign and uh, the critique of Vietnam and when King goes from being really more mainstream into this radical revolutionary posture, uh, we see sort of Hoover's vice-like grip on different presidential administrations. It's Bobby Kennedy who allows the wiretap. Uh, it, it seems as Hoover always has something on different presidents. Obviously, he knew about Jack Kennedy and the affair that Kennedy had when he sure. was younger uh, with somebody who was uh, basically a spy. Uh, and and he had everybody's number, but I love the the tape with LBJ where LBJ is saying, you know, I shouldn't go to this thing uh, after Dr. King wins the Nobel uh, Prize. Price. So um, talk to us about you know Hoover's impact on uh, presidents and how the Department of Justice looked at um, Dr. King and the civil rights movement because Hoover certainly um, consistently slandered King in private with secret reports and uh, even uh, lied to President Johnson and said King was now going to be uh, pushing for violence. <laughs> and, 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 and Johnson is under such siege at that point, he, I think he almost believes it. Uh, and King had never ever supported violence. He just was always saying that we had to look at the deeper roots behind the urban rebellions. That's right. Um, yet Hoover, uh, we know the FBI knew about white supremacists attacking people uh, who were freedom riders, attacking people in Mississippi and other places. Not only did the FBI not help solve and prevent violence, they were culpable in the anti-Black racism and violence and murder that occurred throughout this period. So it's really remarkable uh, to have this sort of secret police inside of the United States that when it comes to civil rights, I mean, these folks were acting like uh, the Stasi. They were acting like it was East Germany uh, and other places, a secret police. Obviously, they murdered Fred Hampton on December 4th, 1969. But certainly, as your film suggests, I um, thought it was fascinating James Earl Ray and the fact that initially they don't want anything to do with it. And they were surveilling Dr. King 
yet they don't know who killed Dr. King and then they're under pressure uh, and they come up with James Earl Ray. You saw Andy Young in your film says, James Earl Ray had nothing to do with Dr. King's death. Right. At least that's the, that's, you know, that's the interpretation of people very close to King. So talk to us about all that. Cause I think your, your film, I thought by the time I finished it, I was very much um, undone in the sense of uh, they, they committed so many acts of not just criminality, but real evil uh, acts well, you, uh, that I, they I, haven't paid a price for. Well, I think what you, you've hit a lot of things right on the head, Neil. I mean, here we are, you know, let's go back to 64 with the murders of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. The FBI had to be pushed to want to investigate those murders, right? Anytime there was something happening in the civil rights movement when someone was killed, be it Medgar Evers or be it Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, or be it Dr. King, they had to have their feet put to the fire to be active, you know? That says a lot about the mindset of the FBI and Jay Hoover and people like Deloach and William Sullivan. Yep. You know, so they were never ever, you know, thinking about, you know, how to help the black community, how to support the black civil rights activists. And and Dr. King knew it, Andy Young knew it, everybody knew that the FBI was always a day late and a dollar short, as my mm -hmm. parents would say. You yeah. know. And although Sam, as your film shows. Dr. King's understanding evolves over time, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah it's, it's like, he, he's not necessarily initially understanding the depth of Hoover's contempt and obsession with him. Yeah, because, you know, listen, I, I, I personally think that deep down, Dr. King did know. Okay. You know, I, I don't think he wanted to really admit it until it really was like in his face, you know? Okay. But that sequence of Clarence Jones was, his house was bugged. And you yeah. know, saying Dr. King has, you know, refused to really want to deal with it. But then he finally, as you said, he finally came to that realization. I think what's interesting too is that the impact that Hoover had on the administrations was very strong. Yeah. I mean, because yeah, as you said, you know, Peniel, he had so much information. He had he had documents on everybody. Everybody. But what I found fascinating is when you're listening to the audio tapes, the audio excerpts from Johnson. It's interesting how his trajectory sort of changes. His first conversation that we hear is with Dr. King and he's, him and Dr. King seem buddy, buddy. And Dr. he's saying to Dr. King, call me, collect if you yeah. want to talk next time. Then the second audio excerpt is when one of his, I guess, assistants say, you know, King has won the Nobel Peace Prize and he really, should you meet him? And now, you know, uh, Johnson knows about those extramarital affairs. And he says, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, we want to associate with him because he's been getting that information from Hoover. Yeah. And by the time we get to that third audio excerpt, where King has basically come out against Vietnam, which was really the nail in the coffin for Dr. King yeah. and his relationship yeah. with the Johnson administration, mm -hmm. you can hear now Johnson's talking with Hoover, you know, to make sure they get any information they can that can help, you know, destroy Dr. King's reputation because. When Dr. King makes that speech, April 4th, 1967, one year before his actual assassination, mm -hmm. that he had to know was going to do irreparable damage to the movement's connection to the Johnson administration. And you know this, that it was not only the Johnson administration that was upset that King came out against the war, but even within the movement itself, yes. there were some leaders who felt Dr. King had walked out of his lane. He had left his lane. How come you're all of a sudden going to be anti-war? What about the civil rights movement? But to me, that was a sort of a narrow-mindedness from my perspective of those other leaders because Dr. King, he wasn't just about civil rights, man. He was about human rights, Yeah, you know? And he understood that also practically the kind of money that was being invested in fighting in Vietnam from an economic perspective could have been used to help poor people of all colors in America have better lives. Yeah. You know, that was that was one of his motivations for creating that poor people's campaign, you know. And but the thing you other thing you see in this film too is that as he's being bombarded by Hoover, he's also dealing with a civil rights struggle that, you know, there's some as you know, there's fractures within the movement. Yeah. When we get to Selma, you know, and his the tensions between SCLC and SNCC and Stokely. You know, those are things that started to really grow and spread out, you know. So Dr. King had a lot on his plate. I mean, I, I imagine he's dealing with the, the internal conflicts in the movement. He's dealing with, you know, 
challenging place in place, challenging people in places like Selma. He's dealing with his probably own personal issues with his, you know, his extramarital affairs and the impact on his relationship with Coretta. You know, he's dealing knowing that he's being monitored 24 seven by Hoover and his agents. You know, that's why you see a certain kind of weariness set in. What's yeah. interesting that the first time we meet Dr. King after that, we have that prologue, the March on Washington, is this young dynamic minister in 1955, 56 in Montgomery, yeah. Alabama during yeah. his first interview. Yeah, it was great. You fast forward to his speech, you know, in Memphis the night before his assassination. This is a man who's been through some, some bumps in the road, man. Some bumps in the road. Yeah, and you know, Sam, I think one of the things your film captures really well, um, especially in the context of our age of Black Lives Matter, is the way in which um, the civil rights movement was in Black power movements. And you, you have really both in there, especially when King is around the Poor People's Campaign um, and King's in Chicago and other places. <laughs> but these are movements uh, for radical democracy to transform fundamentally uh, yeah. American democracy and human rights. Um, when, when I think about uh, what you show and the trajectory, I was really reminded of the Black Lives Matter movement and this movement, again, for radical democracy. But mm -hmm. I'm thinking about law enforcement here, because your, your, your movie is really about, I think, not just Dr. King's relationship with the FBI, but with these uh, very conservative racist structures uh, and institutions in American democracy uh, that really congeal around law and order and law enforcement. And I think it really says something that the BLM, uh, even as it's connected to all these other uh, movements, um, has really argued that the criminal justice system is a gateway to panoramic systems of oppression, you know, racial segregation in public schools, poverty, unemployment, violence, residential segregation, environmental racism, wealth inequality, you name it. Um, and so I think that your film does a beautiful job of looking at the FBI's role in really allowing law enforcement to uh, really demonize civil rights struggles, right? Um, law enforcement to brutalize Black people, whether it's in Birmingham or Selma or Memphis, uh, and finally murder Dr. King in terms of um, uh, certainly they're saying it's James Earl Ray, but if you watch the film, you can, you can, you can sense that it's not just uh, some random guy that was going to just shoot Dr. King. I mean, the people who uh, really hated him the most were, were the state, right? And in, in, right. in any way, he, you can argue he's still a victim of state-sanctioned violence that they set up a climate that he can be assassinated in, uh, even if they're not the, 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 the trigger men or women. So talk to us about that in terms of the law enforcement. And, and it's, it's so interesting because, you know, your film is also a corrective to lies like the film Mississippi Burning, uh, where they said the FBI agents, Willem Dafoe and Gene Hackman and stuff, they're the heroes. So the lie that Hoover, you know, Hoover is part of the whole lost cause, white supremacist lie, American exceptionalism about, de you know, dehumanizing Black people uh, and, and setting up America as this wonderful place where all things are possible. Uh, and and you, you, you really uncover uh, and strip away the veneer uh, behind that lie, especially as it relates to law enforcement. It really made me think about BLM. It made me think about George Floyd. It made me think about um, Breonna Taylor and so much of the violence. Because these folks, I mean, King faced a lot of violence and he tried to combat it with love. Uh, but these folks were monsters, man. These folks were not, these were evil, evil people and evil forces that King was facing. And these forces are among us uh, today. And it seems like they've multiplied, you know, because we like to lie to ourselves and talk about racial progress. Uh, but we have premature victory laps in the United States when it comes to racial progress, right? Yeah, we have so talk to us about that. We have amnesia, amnesia, absolutely. Amnesia, man. And I think you hit it right on the head. I think by watching this film, it becomes a reflection of where America is at today. It's on the same trajectory that it was back in the 60s. The idea of law and order being the thing that's going to keep Black people in their place still exists, as we know, you know, is, is as prevalent today as it was back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that stands out. I mean, when you're hearing, 
when you're hearing the the woman on their television show ask Dr. King, say you know, ask Dr. King, question, don't you feel that your protests are causing riots in the cities? All you gotta do is then listen to what was happening in this past year in the election. We had you know certain certain lawmakers, certain people from Congress saying the same thing about the Black Lives Matter movement. When the, when when people are trying to connect the fact that. Dr. King's connection to Stanley Levinson and the notion of communism is going to infiltrate and destroy the movement. We heard, we heard the same thing from Trump on the stump. If you know when he's saying things like, "If you elect these socialist Democrats, yeah, you know they're going to destroy yeah. our suburbs. They're going to destroy yeah. the fabric of American democracy." Yeah. So you're right on. You're right on track, Peniel, about the idea that many of those things that we see in the film are still really very relevant today in America. You know which is it's really a sad state, you know? And the other thing that's fascinating to me is how people from the right and the left have, have locked on this idea that Dr. King is so different from the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, you know? yeah. He's so iconic, he, you know, not realizing that what is what I call America's amnesia, mm -hmm. you know? Because back in the 60s, as I was saying earlier, he wasn't as popular. I mean, let's use the parallel example of Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. and he refused to go into the service and he decided to change his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. He was considered in America in the 60s a pariah. Yeah. He was a pariah, man. You couldn't give Ali away. He couldn't get a job, you know. But then all of a sudden, 20 years later, he's got Parkinson's. He can barely talk. You know, can, his hands are shaking. He's lighting that, that torch in, in Lanza Olympics. Now he's the greatest. And you see, you know, you see every, all these different people say, oh, he's such a great man. He was so wonderful. He was so wonderful. Again, it's America's amnesia, you know, it's this amnesia about the truth of what America really was that people don't want to, people still don't want to come to the reckoning that America was founded on the enslavement of black people and the genocide of native people, you know, and, and, and they refuse to want to deal with that. You know, and that's why we're still in this, what I call this, this ever ending sort of cycle where this, the stuff keeps happening. You know, you know, the, the, the prison industrial system, mm -hmm. you know, the killing of black men and women on the streets. And it's, you know, it's amazing though, Peniel, now that we got body cams, you would think it would change. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Right. No, body cams are not looking at the structural, the no. structural uh, violence against our, our communities. I thought a real moving part of the film was when um, there's a white journalist who asks uh, King uh, near the end of the film about, you know, comparing blacks to immigrants and Jews and other places. Oh, yeah. How come black folks, you know, haven't made it? Is it just because they're black? And King really answers him really so well, talking about uh, racial slavery, the caste system, uh, wealth inequality, uh, the Homestead Act for white folks while black people didn't get 40 acres and a mule, really gives them a lesson on white supremacy. I thought that was great. And you have some other um, really great and cogent clips of King, what I call the revolutionary King in my book, uh, where he, he, in that last year, he's so, he's so good and he's so, um, he's really angry. So I want you to talk to us about that because that, that King from 66 to 68 exceedingly, is different from the king before. And he's very angry. I argue that he becomes the prosecuting attorney that Malcolm X had been. And Malcolm had evolved into a statesman and King had been a statesman <laughs> and he becomes this prosecuting attorney. I mean, I, if he had been able to get a meeting with Lyndon Johnson, he would have been screaming at him. He's, he's, I don't he think so. Say, I, I, think I, don't think, I think he would have been. I think, I think, I think post 67, he would have been. I don't think post so, 67, man. He would have been. I, I don't think so. Listen, I, I, I see that there's an anger and awareness in King, but King was too strategic. He wasn't a guy who was going to lose his temper and blow, blow his top. I think so, post Vietnam, I think. Post I don't agree. Side, I don't agree. I think post Riverside. I, I, don't, I don't agree. I, I think don't you agree. agree man. In, fact, in fact, if you see some of the interviews post Riverside, he's actually agitated in those interviews. I think it's remarkable and he's great. He's a little agitated, but he's always, he's always composed, Vanille. He's always composed. You know, I mean, all these guys are pretty, I mean, even Malcolm, even Malcolm at his most, you know, fiery, he was very composed. Oh, know? yeah, I don't mean anger as meaning you're out of control, but I mean anger 
in an actually good and clarifying way. So I think that he would have, he would have, he would have, he was, he was very, very angry at the end. And I think anger is actually um, a good emotion. I think BLM has been angry. They've been empathetic and loving as well. Yeah, I, I don't think just because you're black, you can't be angry. Yeah, yeah, but, but what I'm saying to you is that I, I, I understand what you're saying in terms yeah. of a, a certain kind of anger, but Dr. King was also, a, he was extremely coherent. Oh, of course. He yeah. presented himself, you yeah. know. Yeah. He never, you know, sure, I mean, listen, after years of all he had gone through, you could see that there's a weariness and there's a frustration, but it didn't stop him from saying, I still have a mission to accomplish. Of I course. Mean, that's why he went to Memphis. You know, he didn't want to go to Memphis. You know that. He didn't really want to go to Memphis. No, no. <laughs> but even that final speech, and I know um, uh, Paul Steckler and <coughs> on Eyes on the Prize, and when you look at the I may not get there with you speech, uh, he's, he's, he's angry when he's saying somewhere I read about uh, freedom of speech, somewhere I read about freedom of assembly, somewhere I read that the greatness of America lies in the right to protest. protest right. Right. He's right. angry. And as a, he's still coherent, but he's angry. Like King, what's interesting for me, and, and this is why I write about him and Malcolm, and, and, and I admire Dr. King so much is that, you know, when, when King, in my mind, comes to the realization uh, and uh, of the depth and breadth of racism and white supremacy, he, he's, he's on edge and he's, he's telling people um, and speaking his truth uh, in a different way, in a different manner, you know? I think it's quite effective, um, but people don't wanna, people don't focus on that king, you know? They focus on a king who sort of, you know, from Montgomery up into the Nobel Peace Prize, a little bit of Selma, and then that's it. Uh, because yeah, you know, I got to go back. He's uncomfortable. I got to go back. Go, go back and watch this other. Yeah, have you seen the documentary King in the Wilderness? I have. Yeah, I have to go back and watch that one. Did they paint King? I don't remember them painting King like that in that film. No, King. No, King. King. King is in, is is under under evolution in that film, but they definitely focus on the righteous indignation, sort of the prophetic King. The king who's who's you know uh, not feted by people any longer, but still um, really welcome in in black and left communities. I mean, King speaks before seven eight thousand folks at Berkeley. He's at the National Cathedral, uh, getting the Episcopal Cathedral getting standing ovations. Um, Passion Sunday a few days before he dies, you know. Uh, uh, and, you know, the speech remaining uh, awake uh, during a time of great revolution, very, very angry, the drum major speech. But it, I agree with you, Sam, that it's coherent, but I'm saying what's interesting about the anger and the fury is somebody who's come, and I think Watts is one of the turning points for him. It's somebody who's come to a bigger realization and understanding that it's going to take more than just it, reform is not going to be enough. So, so where do you think, here's a question for you, Camille. So what do you think, what, did, how did, what, what was King's feeling after they came out of Chicago, which was a major failure? You know, I, I think Chicago was both a failure and it was a triumph. You know, that's how I think about Chicago. Yeah. Is I think it's a failure as a um, strategic campaign to force the Daly administration into not just open housing, but into basic wealth and power redistribution in Chicago for the city of Chicago, for black folks in Chicago. Um, but I think it's a triumph as a lesson learned for Dr. King that the roots of the problem of white supremacy go beyond a specific city, a specific locale, and you have to go and occupy Washington DC and change it from the ground up. And, and then his strategy becomes this sort of rainbow coalition, but yeah. that's rooted in the black community in Marks, Mississippi. So I think, I think, I think it's a triumph. I think that by the time you get to the poor people's campaign and you know the triple evils, and your your film shows this near the end. I mean, I think that what you see with the poor people's campaign and why, like you said, he didn't want to be in Memphis, but he goes to Memphis. He's trying to coalesce all of it into that's this, right. into that's this right. very effective public but policy and moral imperative. So I think it's a triumph. And again, to show you how great his strategy was, he's assassinated. 
that shows you the, stra the strategy to show you how great the strategy is. Because if it was a bad strategy, he would have lived to 1969 and 1970. If it was, if if you're if you're organizing some stuff that people so say, well, this is not going to work. So you're not, they, is, they don't need to kill you. So you're saying that he was killed because he was changing? Or, or, I'm, well, no, I'm saying he's 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 assassinated um, because he's a he's a revolutionary, but he's also building a revolutionary nonviolent movement that is coming to Washington D.C. and he still has enough global. Uh, impact that they're, they're going to have to do some kind of concessions, the state, and by the state, I mean the U.S. nation state that it doesn't want, want to do, right? So he's, he's assassinated before he can even step foot into Resurrection City. That's how powerful the plan is. The plan is that the strategy, they understand that if King is, is alive that summer and that election season, all eyes are on King and that movement. And who knows what's going to happen? They're not sure what's going to happen. I mean, you, you, not, you may have helped me find my next film from there. I mean, Resurrection City, that's, I mean, that's the key. I mean, that's the key. And again, there's a reason April 4th, I mean, he's about to go to Resurrection City. They don't, they don't let the man live to May and June. That's what I'm saying. It would have been like, he doesn't get to spend a week, a day in Resurrection City with Coretta. Everybody was supposed to be there, right? Stokely was supposed to be there. Stokely and him met in February about Resurrection City. So everyone was gonna be there, right? And they don't let him, so it's not a coincidence, right? And he, he wasn't, I agree with you here, Sam, he wasn't bringing a gun, um, a knife, uh, a curse word to the fight, right? He's bringing his own moral witness, but that was enough and it was too much. And that's why he's assassinated, right? You know, and remember he wants a universal basic income, guaranteed for everybody, guaranteed. So. Uh, you know, King's extraordinary in that in that way, uh, but certainly it's an evolution. Like the person who's trying to do the poor people's campaign is not the same person. And you've got the great clip, Sam, from Montgomery, where he's like, hey, is this is this on yet? Is we're going to yeah, do a practice? A a I had never man. seen that clip. Yeah, that's a different man by the time. I'd never seen that. Clip. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, he's a different man. Yeah. He's a prophetic figure. I mean, King loves the great prophets, Amos, Jeremiah, Amos. Justice rolled down like a mighty stream. That's yeah. who he becomes. We always compare him to Moses, but King and King. You think about the New Testament. King becomes Jesus, and and the and at the temple, the money, the money changers, the money lenders. I mean, he's he, Jesus has righteous indignation, and he's turning over. He's turning over tables. Everybody flees. Everybody runs. You know, he said, "I don't come just to bring the shield. I'm bringing the sword." And that's Doctor King too. So it's extraordinary. It's, I mean, and, we, and, we need to talk, man. You you give me some 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 seeds in my next film. Oh, no, I love, I mean, in terms of the book I'm writing now, I'm seeing MLK and FBI oh, yeah. was really um, revelatory and really exciting um, to see the the evolution and, and how that reverberates that king to this time, you know? And again, I, I'm of the, I argue even in the sword and the shield, the FBI was right to see king as dangerous, you know? Not, not for the reasons they were thinking, but he was dangerous to the status quo. He was. Yes, so yeah, sure. it, it yeah. was it, it's not a negative danger, but King is coming up to people, yes, nonviolently, but he's saying your entire way of life has to end. <laughs> that's a revolutionary. Who yeah, amongst us wants to do that? They say, hey, all them books behind you, you're gonna get rid of all. You're like, hey, what did I do? What did I do? I like to read. Leave me alone. That's, that's right. That say. was the attitude. You know? you know, so these segregationists are like, what did we do? You know, our blacks love being oppressed and raped and assaulted and super exploited. <laughs> it's it's been that way for centuries. They so, love it. We all so what, love it. So Why are you down here? Yeah. Right. So he, he's a very dangerous figure. He really is. <laughs> that's right. And again, telling everybody that we all deserve decent housing and decent food and a universal basic income, this federal government won't give us a $15 minimum wage over five year increase in 2021, right? So no, he, he people, people are scared of Dr. King and, and the oligarchs are scared and they have good reason, right? Right, they have great reason to be scared. All right, man, you, you, you give me a lot of food for thought tonight, good. I, I want to uh, just sort of jump in here because we've got some folks oh, yeah. up. I, I got to say, this is a, such a privilege to hear you guys talk. Uh, I mean, even when you're having a mild dispute here about like, <laughs> also about like, I differ on the tone. Uh, 
amazing to hear this. This is really special. Um, and we have some questions from, from uh, some members of our audience here. <laughs> A mutual friend of, of all of ours here, uh, Paul Steckler, and uh, um, as the as a represent representative of Austin Film Society, <coughs> put this in with pride because it's a question about filmmaking. Um, so uh, it, you know it's been 30, uh, 35 years or more since uh, Eyes on the Prize. Yeah, Sam, what, what is your um, what's your but what's your filmmaking journey been? Is from from starting on eyes to to all the way to where you are now. What, tell, tell us a little bit about that filmmaking journey. Is that Paul's question? It's Paul's question. Paul knows the answer to that question. <laughs> well, here's what I would say. I, I would say that the experience of Eyes on the Prize in many ways, and Paul would agree with this, I think set a template for me in terms of how I approach my filmmaking. The thing that Henry Hampton said to us when we were working on that series, even though some of us resisted it, was the idea that we had to make sure that we heard both, both sides of a story. That we couldn't just have one perspective on the telling of a story, be it going to Chicago, be it in, you know, in, in, um, in, um, with, in Detroit in 67. We had to have two sides of the story. And, and I think when Henry sort of drummed that into us back in 87, 88, that sort of set in, in this template for me in terms of how I approach film. Now, you know, for me, in terms of my career, I've been very fortunate to have been working on films that have been very initially, very active in understanding the politics and the culture of America in terms of the black experience and what that means in terms of being in, in, in white America. Going from working on Eyes on the Prize to working with Spike on a bunch of his films, because you know, he's very political. Going back to working with Henry Hampton on Make Me a World, doing the rise and fall of Jim Crow and my latest films about Sammy Davis Jr. and his struggles in terms of how to fit in in America and August Wilson, Slavery by Another Name. So, you know, the, the journey has been one where if you had told me this when I first started my career, I would be doing these films that are so, you know, emotionally and politically intense about who we are as African-Americans in this country and the, and, the, and the struggles that we constantly have to fight and overcome. I would probably say, no, no, no. I want to just be a film editor and, and work on feature films. Well, that didn't turn out to be my journey, but I'm glad I was on, I'm, I'm glad I've been on this road. <laughs> you know, one thing, Sam, I think that you got from Henry Hampton too, and I think uh, Paul would agree is that until the very, very end of the film, uh, you, 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 uh, you let the actors, the historical actors who are there dominate the film. There's people who, who, are, who are talking, but you don't have talking heads. Way, way at the end, you've got Donna Merch and different people really at the end, but you, yeah, you don't have folks um, on camera. And, and certainly um, I remember talking to Paul with, with, with uh, about eyes and Henry Hampton didn't, um, you know, interview anybody who, who, who wasn't there and didn't experience. That's right. That's so if experience. you weren't there, you're not, there were no, there were no um, historians or academics or talking. It was, it was That's people. Right. And the people who were there, we had the experience. That's exactly right. That's another thing I learned from Henry too. Very important. Um, I, we have a question from Jessel. We have a couple of good questions from Jessel Bradford. I'm going to choose this one, um, and maybe we get a chance to get to the other one too. But um, Jessel says, "Is there danger in presenting Dr. King as victim? Is that part of our hero making? As was Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, even George Floyd, enemy? Yes, revolutionary? Yes." arousing fear among Anglos, yes, human even, but victim. The term creates a different image, arouses a different motivation possibly among African-Americans, particularly African-American youth. Well, I would say I don't see, I don't think I've painted him as a victim. Yeah, no. You know, I, I don't think I did that at all. That wasn't my goal. And I think that would be a mistake for anybody to walk away thinking that's what he is in this film. I think the thing you need to understand about this film is that the FBI are uh, basically secret police was out there to destroy anybody who were trying to empower our people. You know, as, as Peniel said it, he was a revolutionary, mm -hmm. you know? And the fact that all of a sudden this revolutionary was coming along and saying what Peniel just said so eloquently, you know, he's gonna upset the apple cart, mm -hmm. you know? Why are you gonna upset the apple cart, you know? These black people hadn't said anything for a hundred years. So what, now why are you gonna come here and, and get them all riled up? That, that's not a victim. That's a man yeah. who's actually very proactive, yeah. you know, and wanted to make changes in America. 
And, you know, we can we can say, though, he was assassinated. He was targeted for destruction and violence by the state. And he confronted all of <laughs> it. Uh, but certainly he was and black people, too, have been traumatized. But focusing, I think what 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 Sam's film does well is focus on not just the trauma, but really the the mission and the joy that he he took uh, undergoing that mission within that mission. So it's really a dialectical relationship always uh, being black um, in America and globally that you have all these challenges and these conflicts that really do impact you. So it's not just this heroic story, right? So there are traumas, right? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Small and large traumas, but then there's also joy and resilience and you see Dr. King never gives up. So he's not a victim. I think, I think white people um, often say that when black people talk about the depth and breadth of racism and white supremacy uh, and demonization and dehumanization, it's victimization. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a misnomer, right? Yeah, I yeah. agree. Um, we have a question from our friend Kevin who asks about the use of some of the uh, sort of pro FBI propaganda, the big Jim McLean and the FBI <laughs> that's that, great. Uh, that you that you use in it. It's funny because I'll, I'll just kind of throw in that when you see it, when you see that propaganda now, it looks like such propaganda. Um, um, so tell us about the use of that. And also like, what do you, do you, do you see propaganda now? And are you, are you sort of tracking it in a way that maybe a lot of people are kind of missing? Well, listen, the, the reason that I, I said, I had said to my editor, Laura Tomaselli, when we started the editing process, I gave her a list of titles of these old Hollywood films that basically were extolling the virtues and the values of the FBI. Mm -hmm. And I said, we want to be able to look at that and really, you know, undercut that. And that's why we went to those films because, you know, those films were basically myth. They were myth about the FBI. The thing to remember, the thing that anyone of any, anybody who's thinking now about America and who we are as Americans and looking at how America still puts out the propaganda about the FBI and any other agency within this government, you have to always take everything with a, a grain of salt. You can't, you can't believe anything you, and you shouldn't. You know, when you see Christopher Ray before the House Committee, you know, the senators talking about the, 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 what the FBI is doing and how on top of things they are, you, you, you're supposed to really say, really? You know, you're not supposed to buy into that. You know, I mean, if they were so, they were so on top of things, why did we have January 6th, you know? Yeah. You know, it just, it just it again, goes back to when the Black Lives Matter protests happening in DC in the summer of 2020, and they, they marched on the Capitol, what did you see in front of that Capitol building? You saw the National Guard out in full force, out in full force. There was no one was gonna breach the Capitol building during those protests. Yep. January 6, you know, you're going to tell me that the FBI wasn't aware that this crowd that was being, you know, pushed on by Trump and others was not going to be aware that these people may try to breach the Capitol. It, you know, again, it's the FBI, you know, never really wanted to step up and do supposedly what they're supposed to do. But they're basically doing the bidding of a government that says, you know, Black Lives Matter people are trouble. You yep. know, but but these right wing extremists, well, they're not so bad. They're not going to cause too much trouble. Well, we saw what happened. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if um, I mean, if there's a villain in the piece, um, is it still the FBI? I'm assuming there might be a villain of the piece. Maybe there's not a villain in the piece today, but is it the FBI? Is it uh, sort of police brotherhoods, police unions? Um, where, how is this force sort of coalescing now? Two words, man, that, that Peniel used that still exists very strongly, the idea of law and order. Mm -hmm. What yeah. does that really mean? Yeah. You know, take, let's, let's sort of dissect that. That's like going back to, to the 18 in slavery with the yeah. slave catchers. Yeah. You know? They yeah. were the law and order back at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, when, 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 we, when, when the black people were freed, and they were trying to sort of figure out how to make a living and they were traveling around. Sometimes in the South, they would be arrested and put into prison and made to work, you know, right. because supposed law and order. Well, yes, yeah, you gotta, you gotta be mindful yeah. of it. 
law and order, you know, it was a catchphrase for keep them in their place. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you did it, uh, Sam, in terms of slavery by another name and all this. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, what's extraordinary, I think now, and I think you can see the, <laughs> the, the real fear against the phrase defund the police tells you everything you need to know. Because exactly. this idea of defunding the police is this idea of investing in black and brown communities over uh, punishment, over systems of punishment and incarceration and premature death. And when you see the violent response from whites in the suburbs, whites in politics and culture, uh, everything from oligarchs to your ordinary average white racist, uh, it's extraordinary. And so you really see the large role that just law enforcement has played uh, in terms of the racial caste system and demarcation. And Sam is right when he talks about slave catchers. Those are early police forces. You know, yeah. before you ever had, uh, right now we have um, 800,000 police in the United States, 18,000 uh, police departments. And before you ever had that, you had slave catchers and you had slave uh, bounty hunters, right? right? And so what you find the FBI and the DEA and the sheriff's departments, all these things are there to mitigate uh, and push back against this idea of, of black citizenship and black dignity through violence, through violence. And it's important for us to understand it. And that's why there's a real fear of defund the police. Certainly part of the fear is, is Trumpism and this idea of he was yelling Chicago and Chicago where the blacks are and this race baiting, right? Part of it is that but another part of it is really not that people who have a clear eyed understanding that they don't want uh, they don't want the great society. They want the war in Vietnam right here in the United States. Right. And that's why Nixon said, let's do the drug war when there was no drug uh, right, crisis right. in the United States. He did that to divert uh, massive resources towards um, a whole constellation of law enforcement and surveillance that went into housing projects. Elizabeth Hinton's new book, America on Fire, looks at that very, very specifically. It's so, so pernicious. And that's why I think it's great to look at MLK and the FBI, because I think that what Sam captures in microcosm is what we're all facing today. You know, And in that sense, the FBI becomes a stand-in for law and order. Okay, And King becomes a stand in for social justice and human rights, right? right? But but for King, human rights and social justice was always refracted through a prism of race. He always understood the only way to get to the universal was through the particular struggle of black people because of the specific history in the United States. He's always very clear about that. Well, um, I'm reminded that uh, we're approaching eight o'clock and you guys have a, uh, there's another event that Sam has to get to yeah. after this. So um, this has been such a great privilege on behalf of everybody who's joined us, uh, who's watched the film and who's listened to you. I wanna thank you so much. And I also wanna remind everybody who's, uh, who's watched this film and has joined us for this conversation that this, is, this film's a going concern. It's out there right now. So. Yeah. Um, it, it means a lot. Um, I, I guarantee you within your own little social network, you are a person with great taste who is greatly respected. So tell people about this film. Tell people that you saw it. Um, and I don't know about all of you who watched it, but I've got my next few books uh, mapped out because I'm just so fascinated by this era and by this period uh, yeah. and my few movies that I wanna watch, my doc documentaries mapped out as well. So um, you guys have provided me uh, with so much to think about and I'm sure I speak for everyone who joined us for this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Sam. I'm gonna be teaching this book. This is brilliant. Um, it's a brilliant film and it's really um, vital. It stands right in that library alongside of things like Eyes on the prize and these really Thanks, uh, iconic, Thanks. important. Well, we should we should we should stay in touch, man, because you definitely give me some ideas. Oh yeah, no, let's talk. Let's chop yeah, it up. Yeah, no, yeah, let's chop yeah, it up. Cool. No. All right, all right, cool. I'm gonna head out to my next assignment. <laughs>